Hello, I'm Rajesh Merchandani and thanks for joining me for the CGD podcast. Recently, CGD launched a new major report into how laws that are designed to prevent money being sent overseas to terrorists or criminals can have unintended consequences for innocent people in developing countries. And let's just stress that these laws were brought in because of very real concerns about security. And that's something that's been brought home to us again by the recent terror attacks in Paris. But here's the problem. They're called Anti-Money Laundering and Combating the Finance of Terrorism Laws, AML CFT, and they carry huge fines for financial institutions that do not comply because, knowingly or not, they've done business with someone who turned out to be dodgy. So to avoid the risk of the potential fine, banks are pulling out of markets they see as potentially risky, and that tends to mean developing countries. It's called de-risking. This problem has been recognised at the highest levels of the G20 as well. And recently, Dr Nathan Sheets, who's Under Secretary of Treasury for International Affairs, came to CGD to help launch our report with a speech about the problem. I sat down with him afterwards to record an interview. That's today's podcast. Remember, it was recorded before the Paris terror attacks. We'll hear that podcast in a second. But first, let's hear a clip of his speech. We take the challenges surrounding correspondent banking relationships and money service businesses seriously. And we are committed to to addressing them in a way that protects our joint goals of supporting financial connectivity and inclusion and maintaining the integrity of the financial system. Both of these goals are essential. We realize, however, that to achieve this outcome, not only do banks have to commit significant resources and take on new responsibilities, but policymakers must do so as well. That was Nathan Sheets, Under Secretary of Treasury for International Affairs, speaking recently at CGD about the problem of de-risking. Now, here we look at this through a development lens. De-risking impacts people who depend on money sent home by foreign migrant workers, remittances. Uh, It also impacts small businesses or banks in developing countries that need access to capital and to the international financial system. And it can impact organisations, say, like NGOs, operating on the ground doing humanitarian or disaster relief. So that's why it matters to us here at CGD. But when I spoke to Dr Sheets, I started by asking him why it matters so much to the US Treasury. I articulated uh, a framework in my remarks that emphasized these joint goals of, on the one hand, we want to do everything we possibly can to ensure that the financial system is able to efficiently intermediate and mobilize resources to their most efficient use across the globe, wherever that may be. A related objective that I would put in that cone of efficiency is uh, uh, continue to allow uh, people across the world to have access to the system. So this this objective of uh, financial inclusion is uh, crucial and central for us, along with uh, uh, thinking about uh, uh, generating a financial system that's able to support growth uh, over the medium to long run. And then the second core value that I articulated that I think is important is we want to make sure that the system uh, has integrity and, it, and is not abused. So it's this, it's this uh, joint pursuit of these various objectives. And I think all of them are crucial and all of them are, are uh, right at the heart and core of Treasury's mandate. Uh, and there's almost an irony here, isn't there, that uh, anti-money laundering and combating the finance of terror laws, AML, CFT, Uh, are designed to make international financial flows more transparent. But is there a risk that uh, de-risking is driving these transactions on the ground, making the system more opaque? Uh, My feeling is the the point you make uh, underscores how important it is for the policy community to get this right. Uh, We want to see see, uh, these flows occur, and to the extent possible, we want to see them occur in the, in the, in the conventional uh, regulated banking system. Let's pick up on a few things that you talked about. Um, it's banks that are doing the de-risking. Banks are often portrayed as the bad guys. Uh, but they're the ones who are saying, and you know, we've got examples of this in the report, that the rules are confusing. You talked about this in your, your comments. In fact, in our report, we, we document 31 different agencies with jurisdiction in this area in the US alone. 
and then that's not even getting into the complexities in Europe. How are you trying to clarify that, or how important is it to kind of wade through that sort of that, that labyrinth? The uh, the issue of of clarity and of communication is uh, absolutely front and center. Uh, my sense is that if there is one challenge uh, for us in the official sector, it's to continue the efforts that we've started. And I think that. Uh, in, uh, in recent years, we've, we've made progress, but there's clearly, there's clearly more work to be done to uh, articulate uh, what is expected of banks, uh, uh, what it means from our perspective uh, as official sector and from the perspective of the regulators, what it means to manage the risks, and uh, to underscore that uh, these requirements uh, don't envision uh, zero tolerance or, or zero error. So there's work to be done both by the regulators and by the banks. Let's come on to the banks in a sector. What more in a second? What, what more do you think, or what would you, would you like to see in terms of the regulatory landscape on this? If you could, if you could change it now, right? So uh, in my in my remarks, I articulated a very rich work program that is occurring uh, in the official sector. Uh, under the uh, umbrella of the FSB, uh, which is including uh, this whole set of issues, I actually have better data collection that I think will allow us to better define and banks to better understand what is happening and to make better decisions, uh, cl further clarification of what's expected, uh, an increased uh, 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 technical assistance to support compliance. I think all of these things uh, are necessary. Uh, the FSB is, has been, has been uh, vital in this role. Uh, and uh, in addition, we've also seen uh, a range of constructive uh, contributions uh, from the enforcement side through FAST. So greater technical assistance. So actually, the regulators saying to banks, this is what you need to do, and this is how you need to do it. It would be, I would think that this would be uh, more technical assistance in various jurisdictions where this is happening, where the de-risking has been observed in order for those institutions and uh, counterparties in those jurisdictions to take steps that would uh, uh, make, them, uh, uh, make them less risky in the eyes of the banks. But it's also imperative for the banks to do their part, and this is the, this is the key point that we very much expect banks to be playing a role in financial intermediation. We expect them to play a role in managing risks and not indiscriminately cutting off classes of, of institutions or counterparties. That is exactly the quote from your remarks that I wrote down. In fact, let me just, let's not let the banks off the hook entirely here. You said, I see de-risking as a situation in which financial institutions indiscriminately terminate customer relationships without a careful assessment of the risks and tools available to manage and mitigate those risks. And then you also say, what should they do? They should commit significant resources and take on new responsibilities. So Nicely said. <laughs> <laughs> it was written well. Uh, <laughs> um, what's your message to the financial institutions about their responsibilities, about taking them seriously? So uh, as, I, as I underscored and as that remark indicated, that uh, the role of the banks, and I think that this is a uh, historical role that's well established, is the banks uh, are there to intermediate and to channel funds from from uh, depositors to lenders. And in order for that to happen, they have to manage risk, they have to assess risks, and uh, that's inherent in their business. So uh, the bottom line that I would have is to uh, think carefully on a case-by-case -case basis about the various relationships they have, and to think carefully about the scope that they have to, uh, to manage and to mitigate risks, and not to make decisions uh, um, uh, about a broad class of, of customers. Uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, I'm not saying necessarily there's, that, 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 that the banks have done this, but uh, we have seen a lot of account, account closures. Well, who, who's going to pay for the extra responsibilities that bank, banks should take on board? I mean, they're going to pay for it, but ultimately, who's going to pay for it? Ultimately, ultimately it, will, uh, it will require uh, some investment on the for sake of institutions. Uh, my sense is that it contributes to uh, stronger, safer uh, financial institutions and a stronger, safer uh, financial system. 
And it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, if over time, uh, these kinds of reforms uh, ended up paying for themselves. But I think that in any event, it's, uh, it's consistent with uh, the regulatory initiatives and regulatory agenda that uh, the policy community has pursued in the aftermath of the financial crisis, that uh, capital standards, liquidity standards, leverage standards have all been, uh, been raised. And uh, uh, there might be some costs associated with that in the near term, but over time, I think when you factor in particularly potential social costs that, uh, that uh, occur at the time of financial crises, that it makes the system safer and these institutions safer. One thing you called for was better data, more and better data. Absolutely. It's echoed in the recommendations in the report. But actually, our team is saying that the, a lot of the institutions have data, but they're not sharing it. So is there a way to make them actually share the data? And can we have some of it as well so we can research it better? So, so uh, certainly more data uh, is, is, is positive uh, and, and constructive. Uh, that's very much where we think that this, uh, that this discussion should go. Uh, a related point is that individual institutions have this information. It's important that it be collected and that it be regularized so it can be studied across institutions. And it's also important that uh, to the extent that there are bottlenecks that prevent the sharing of data, that steps be taken to, uh, to eliminate those, those bottlenecks. An example of this is in some of the conversations uh, with Mexican banks. The Mexican banks couldn't share uh, certain kinds of data with, uh, with U.S. banks because of the Mex Mexican bank uh, secrecy laws. And those laws were modified, so that bottleneck was removed, which uh, has facilitated increased discussions uh, with the Mexican banks and has moved in a meaningful direction toward addressing uh, the uh, problems that were occurring in Mexico. If, if this problem is sort of left unchecked, do you worry about its effects on, say, the US banking system? I mean, you mentioned in your remarks your, your responsibility to, to safeguard the integrity of the dollar. I mean, that's quite a leap almost to make. So uh, in, in, in the remarks, I sketched out these three equilibriums, one where uh, financial institutions are backing away and we end up having a less interconnected global uh, financial system. I think that's at the peril of the global economy. It's at the peril of the US economy and the global system. That is clearly, clearly not the outcome that we're looking for. We're looking for the outcome in the third case where institutions take the necessary steps, where regulators, uh, enforcement agents take the steps to clarify uh, expectations, and uh, this business is be able to be brought uh, uh, back on balance sheet uh, in a constructive way. Let's look at this, uh, as we come to a close, let's look at this from a, a slightly alternative perspective. If you want to kind of close these these gaps between what banks think they should be doing and what regulators want them to be doing and get rid of these unintended consequences that we've identified in the report. How do you address that without appearing to be soft on security? Because AML CFT laws were put in place for you know, justifiable and you know, real national security reasons. So that's the, of these two goals of, on the one hand, efficiency and inclusion, and on the other hand, safety, soundness, integrity, that's, that's the other leg of it. And I'm, I'm comfortable that uh, as systems are put in place, as the investment occurs, as uh, uh, financial institutions train their uh, staffs, that uh, the uh, risks associated with uh, this kind of business are risks that can be managed and mitigated rather than ones that they have to pull back from entirely. So I'm reasonably comfortable that over time, as this continues to evolve, as we move, as I mentioned, to the new equilibrium, there will be one that is characterized by financial inclusiveness. Now, finally, G20 leaders are discussing this issue. They're looking at it through the lens of attempts to make remittances cheaper. It's high on the agenda. Uh, what do you want to see come out of the G20 on this issue? My, my feeling is that the G20 uh, in the area of financial inclusion has a uh, robust uh, agenda and it's one that's very much committed to ensuring that these flows continue uh, in the global system and that the cost of these flows remains, uh, remains economic. So I think that uh, it, would be, it would be constructive and it's what I expect to hear the G20 leaders 
continue, uh, endorse the continued work on this. Uh, I think we're on a good trajectory, and we just need to keep moving forward with it. That was Nathan Sheets, Under Secretary of Treasury for International Affairs, speaking with me recently here at CGD. Video of the whole event where Dr. Sheets took part to launch our report on the unintended consequences of anti-money laundering policy is available on our website. So is the report at cgdev.org. And I'm Rajesh Merchandani. Please do join me again for the next podcast from the Centre for Global Development. Mm -hmm.